Well, shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman and we're continuing our series, Riding Out the Storm, A Biblical Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. And even though we are seeing things settle down in uh, respect to um, our um, lockdown here in Ontario and, and elsewhere in Canada and some parts of the United States, we're still fielding some interesting questions and some interesting viewpoints about the times that we are living in. So we're going to be looking at a passage today in Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read those verses. I'm going to key in on only a few of the verses that we're going to read and then I'm going to give an exposition to that and an application. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to direct us. Father God, thank you for each person looking in today. Thank you that we have your word, which is the anchor for our life. We'd ask now that you'd give us uh, guidance in everything we uh, say and do here to give glory and honor to you. And we pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 24, and specifically we're going to read verses 29 to 37. Let's read, please. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall, fall, shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour and knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man shall be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. So, some key verses, the key verses we are going to focus on a little later on as we move along will be verses 32, 34 and 35, and verse 36, maybe a little bit more beyond 36. We're going to focus on the fig tree, which is presented to us in verse 32. I'll tell you now that the fig tree is a parable, and it's a presentation of the people, the nation Israel. Verses 34 and 35, the generation that's mentioned there is the generation that will be alive then, yet future, as they see Jesus coming. And God's timing is known to God only, as per Acts chapter 1, verse 7. And the comparison to Noah's day, as it says and speaks to us in verse 37, is to look at how life is being lived out now, as it was prior when Noah was preaching about a coming judgment via a flood. Now, too many people, <clears throat> and we have continued to receive correspondence on this, too many people have tried to use this pandemic to insist that we are in the tribulation period. For example, and I've cited this one over and over, Revelation chapter 6, 2, one person said to me earlier on when we began this, that wild animals that will come to, to destroy people during the tribulation period, well, this is connected to the COVID-19 virus, which comes out of Wuhan, China, coming from the wet markets where people bought bats to eat, the virus coming from bats entering into the human system, the virus going from one human to the next, becoming a pandemic as it has become, etc. And uh, this is their reasoning that we're in the tribulation period. And they also, many people have said, well, where is the Antichrist? And I've been teaching on this for many years. Where is the Antichrist? I'm not interested where the Antichrist is. I'm interested where the Lord Jesus Christ is. He has not appeared yet in the clouds to remove us from here. So basically, we the church are still here. And because we're still her, here, <coughs> excuse me, the church, by the working through us of the Holy Spirit, is holding back evil from having full control at this time. And this is what is spoken to in 
Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 12. We dealt with that a few weeks back. We, the church, are still here. And until the church is raptured, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, then the day of the Lord will come, coming sometime and starting sometime after the removal of the, of the church. Note again, as we taught a few weeks back, the chronological order, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, immediately after that, the day of the Lord, which is an ancient Old Testament Hebraism, the day of the Lord, meaning the time of God's judgment. It's the end of these events that have not yet occurred yet. And until Messiah returns in Revelation chapter 19, he returns with us, the church that has been removed supernaturally prior to that. So God has given us an ordered outline of events, as I've just reviewed with you. So let's explore, explore these verses in Matthew to receive a little bit more guidance about the times we're living in, displaying to us if, as the title of this message is, if the truth be told. And this is what we're aiming to do here today. Now, I've already mentioned verse 32, the fig tree. It is a parable that Jesus tells here. Now, in the immediate context of when that is told, it is a natural, real tree. It's not symbolic. It is something that would have been understood by the people alive at that time. It is very clear in Scripture that Israel is represented, oftentimes, as a fig tree. In fact, if you go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 18, this is where Jesus uh, makes a curse upon a fig tree that withers after that. They come upon this tree full in bloom, full of leaves, but no fruit on it. And so it's a non-producing fruit tree and symbolic at that point in history of the hardened heart of Israel's religious leaders then and sadly very much so today. There is so much antipathy and hardened hearts towards the truth of the Messiah who is Yeshua HaMashiach, Hebrew for Jesus the Messiah. The fig tree will put forth its fruit and its leaves, it will put forth its leaves again, and it did again in 1948, I'm sorry for that confused sentence there. In 1948, the, nation, the modern day state, modern day nation state Israel was reborn literally out of the ashes of the Holocaust of World War II. In the context of our time, we are seeing a foreshadowing. Israel is a resurrected nation since 1948. They are in the land, but they don't have the spirit within them. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 37, you'll see that the, bear, the uh, dry bones message that is given there, and Ezekiel is expla it's explained to him by God that the bones reassemble, they received the spirit and come back to life, and Israel returns to her land after the Babylonian captivity because of Cyrus, who is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 44, uh, empowering the Jewish people to go back to their land after the Persians overthrew the Babylonians. But that uh, prophecy, like any prophecy, has and always has an immediate and yet future fulfillment. Ezekiel's prophecy was fulfilled somewhere between 539 and 516 BC in various stages of return to the land by the people under Persian rule. And it was fulfilled again in part in 1948. There is a generation of people who are now in the land, but they don't have the spirit within them. Now, there are Jewish believers alive today in Israel, but they do not form the majority of the people. And believe me, they are not allowed to have free reign for the uh, expression of their faith, etc. In fact, in Israel, it is against the law to proselytize on the street. So, here we have Israel then back in the land, Ezekiel 37. Here we have them uh, at the time of Jesus, the fruit of the fig tree, full of leaves, no fruit. A picture of the nation is alive, leaves on the tree, no fruit, nothing coming from the spiritual life that's supposed to be imparted to the world vis-a-vis -vis Israel, the light of God to the, the Gentile nations, all the nations of the world. The generation then that is spoken of 
here in verse 32 that knows of the fair parable of the fruit tree, uh, the fig tree, excuse me, in verse 32. The generation that's spoken of in verse 34 is a generation in the immediate sense there was a generation that saw the fulfillment of many of the events of, of Matthew 24. The temple was being destroyed uh, by Titus in 70 AD and numerous other things and calamities that came upon the Jewish people. But looking forward down the corridor of time, there was going to be a time when Daniel's completion of the total prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27 when the abomination that makes desolate would be erected in the temple it was spoken of once by Daniel it happened when Antiochus Epiphanes came in 165 BC but they were overthrown but Messiah did not appear at that time there's going to be another abomination that makes desolate and that's going to come when there is a seven-year treaty that Israel will sign with the Antichrist. Now remember earlier on a few minutes ago I said I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. In the chronological order of things Messiah will come, Jesus will come to the air to get his people, the church, to remove them from this world before the time of Jacob's trouble begins as Jeremiah the prophet describes it as in Jeremiah chapter 30. And it will be a time for Israel, that's who Jacob is symbolically in that uh, prophetic uh, phrase there, Israel will see a time of trouble like they've never seen before. In fact, I'm, hard, I'm so disheartened to be able to have to say this to you, it will be worse than the Holocaust of World War II decimating the uh, Hebrew nation in Europe. Two-thirds of the people of the House of Israel will perish in the coming Holocaust under the Antichrist. You can read about that in Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14. The chronology of these things and understanding the timing and understanding the place of Israel in the prophetic scriptures as it fits into the scriptures in general, the going out of the gospel to all the world is important. If you do not know Israel's place in the scriptures, you do not know a balanced view of the scriptures. Too, too many churches refuse to teach these things. Too many churches don't pay attention to the prophetic portion. Too many churches have experts in Bible prophecy come in and deal with it and not deal with it themselves and then deal with it only maybe once in a while. <clears throat> I remember the discussion I once had with Dr. Reynolds Showers many years ago on this subject and he said this, the Bible can be divided up into three parts. There's doctrine, theology, history, and eschatology, future things. And all three parts of the Bible should be included in the teaching program of any church over the space of a given year. I don't know what happens in a lot of churches in the teaching of eschatology, end times events. But I do know that many people tell me that they don't ha hear about it in their local church. There are no so-called experts in it. I've had some people call me the Bible prophecy expert. I am no expert in Bible prophecy, no more so than any other pastor is an expert in any other thing himself. What I have done, though, over the years, is I've applied myself to the study of eschatology as well as the study of basic Bible theology and Bible doctrine so that I can give a balanced teaching of the scriptures to you who look in in other places where we get invited to speak and to teach. And so you see, we need to know the important parameters. Where is Israel in Scripture? Where is the church in Scripture? Where are you today in your walk with the Lord? You see, Israel is back in her land in disbelief. And the stage <clears throat> has been presented to be set more and more now since modern-day Israel was reborn in 1948. Maybe the fig tree has produced some leaves, but I can tell you that there is a big hardening towards the gospel going forward in Israel. And those who are there to preach the gospel in Israel do it well, but do it with 
the only the abilities that they're allowed to use within the parameters of the laws of the land. So they're not part of that generation, as verses 34 and 35 of Matthew 24 speak to. The generation that is spoken of there in Matthew 24, 34, and 35 will be the generation of people who will be alive, living in the land, after the church has been raptured, after the Antichrist, who comes as a man of peace, signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. After he does that, and after in the middle of that seven years, he erects an image of himself in the temple that he is going to allow Israel to rebuild and says, now you will worship me, I am God. Then, and only then, will you see the generation that will see all these things come to pass. They, this is the generation that comes after the rapture of the church, after the treaty with the Antichrist, after the breaking of that treaty. When? Only the Lord knows, and that's what verse 36 tells us. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. This was Jesus, who was fully man and fully God. But the thing about who Jesus is, he sits at the right hand of God the Father now, uh, present tense. The thing about who Jesus is, is that when he was here the first time, he gave up certain of his godly prerogatives. And he said, I don't know, the Father in heaven will, does know, and when it's time, he'll tell me to come. So the illustration then is made of Noah's time. Verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Noah built a large seagoing vessel in dry dock. I've often described it as the vessel that would be used of God to rescue the one of whom God was gracious to. Now, what's interesting is that when you go to the Noah account in Genesis chapter 6, specifically Genesis 6 verse 8, the word grace appears for the first time in the whole of the Bible. All the way back then, not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, Genesis 6, 8. It says there that Noah found grace in the sight of God. The word grace literally is translated as unmerited favor. So if Noah found grace in the sight of God, he found unmerited favor with God. He didn't deserve it, but he was a righteous man to the best of his abilities who lived his life. That's the first time grace appears, but it's not the only time it appears. You see, early on in the time of God's involvement with his uh, creation here, even as he judged the people of that time, he still showed grace to those who followed him. They may have been a small band, Noah, his three sons, Noah's wife, his son's three wives, but they still were shown grace, God's unmerited favor. And it's still being shown today. Now, because of that, you can read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Maybe you read about grace a little differently, knowing about it back in Genesis 6, 8. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, but not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man boast. We all are easy to boast about how good we are. Yet, in that time of judgment, at Noah's time, grace still abounded. And how much more will it abound future, yet future? Grace abounded at the time of Noah, and this is how. God still provided a way out from the coming judgment at that time, which was the flood. He used a big boat built in dry dock where seven of the sevens of the clean animals came in and the other animals came in and they were separated on the deck and the and below and above. And, and then Noah and his family came in and God sealed the door and the waters came and the ones found on the ark were the ones allowed to survive the judgment. The waters symbolize the judgment at that time. The waters symbolize a foreshadowing of the judgment that's going to come to planet Earth when the events of the book of Revelation come. Except this time, God's not going to use a man-made boat to rescue his people. This time, the ark is going to be 
in the reasoning of the rapture of the church. He is going to come and save you by your faith, by grace. Your unmerited favor will still be found in the eyes of God. Why? Because if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have made a profession of faith in his atoning work on that cross, Jewish or Gentile, he still will show grace. It's, except this time, no flood. A flood of judgment. But to be removed from that judgment in the ark of the rapture of the church. How much more will it abound God's grace at a later time? When he fulfilled this back in Noah's time, it was a foreshadowing of how he would fulfill it even yet future. It points us to Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. So many people are still worried, scared there's going to be a second coming of this virus that may be worse than the first, and there's no vaccine to, to save anybody yet from it. And I've told you that in recent weeks, we have struggled with the personal loss of family member to COVID-19. Yes, it's hit our family as well. We know it's real. We've seen it. But there's a way to circumvent all of that. This life is frail. It will end. But where will you spend your eternity? We ask you that question today simply because you need to make a decision if you haven't. Do you know Jesus as personal Savior? And if you do, well then praise the Lord. What are you doing with what God has given you? This current pandemic crisis should not have you looking for um, the Antichrist or looking for all kinds of other things that would be wrong with this world, conspiracies of this and that and the other. It should point you to seeing that God is trying to get our attention and he has called us to go out and make disciples of all the nations. Matthew 28 verses 18, 19, and 20. Can I encourage you to be that and to go out and make disciples of all the nations? Israel's Hope Ministries exists as an organization to do what you've just seen here, teach the word and encourage people to live for God at a difficult time right now. And we are a faith ministry. We trust God's people to meet our needs. And if you feel led of the Lord to provide for that, we would praise God for that. You can go to our webpage at www ihopecanada.org There you can find where you can give an e-transfer, giving an e-transfer here in Canada, or through PayPal, Canada or the United States through PayPal. Or if you would like, you can send a, a regular check in the mail. Our ma regular mailing address is found there as well. If you are in the United States and would like to receive a, an IRS tax receipt, you can send your check to I Hope USA. 2330 Norton Lane, North Bloomfield, Ohio, 44450. If you'd like to speak with me, drop me an email. If you have a question about things you've heard, want to discuss some things that you've heard, send me an email, ron at ihopecanada.org. Our webpage again is www.ihopecanada.org. We do praise the Lord for you looking in on us today. We hope this has been an encouragement to you. Until next time, we say shalom.